We're talking about prayer that works this morning. We're talking about James chapter 5, verse 13 through 18. And this passage of scripture is written to each one of us. James is uh, telling us that whatever the load is that we are carrying, uh, whatever the challenge is, whether it's mental or physical or spiritual, you're not to carry it alone. And we have an incredible Heavenly Father who says, let him help you carry your load. Uh, Some of us are determined to carry our load ourselves. We think that our burdens are our burdens and that we need to carry them. I've actually had people say to me, in all my life, I have never prayed for myself. And I'm going, really? You're kidding me. You know, when you have a need, you need to pray about it. When you have a burden, you need to pray about it. You need to take it to God and find out how he can help you through his incredible power. Uh, Some of us, though, uh, have tried carrying the load ourselves, and finally have gotten to the place where we just stop and we scream out, uh, I can't do this by myself anymore. And then we discover the power of prayer. James chapter 5, we've already read it, but you need to hear it again. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. If anyone among you is sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it may not rain. It didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. This is a passage for every one of us, okay? If anyone in this room is troubled, in conflict, suffering, you are something is wearying you, a relationship you have needs help, The burden you are carrying is heavy. This scripture is for you. It may be a job issue that you're facing. It may be that you're struggling with a spiritual issue. It may may be that you're struggling with a sin that you can't get victory over or an addiction. This passage is for you. And the solution to all these things that are bothering us, troubling us, wearying us, is prayer. Now, we know what prayer is. Prayer is simply talking to God. And James says, if you've got a problem, you need to talk to God about it. Now, before we get into the text itself, there are two words that can mess us up. Uh, One is the word elders, and the other is uh, the word righteous. And the word elders refers to two different kinds of people. Uh, First, the word elder itself means overseer, and it can refer to uh, a titled person as an elder, or it can refer to someone who is older. But they're not just older, they're older and they have walked with God for a significant period of time. They have much more experience and much more wisdom and much more understanding in the Christian walk than those who have only been Christians for a week or a month or a year. And if you need somebody to pray for you, you really want to find somebody who has been doing the Christian walk for some significant period of time. So that's the first idea of elder. The second idea of elder is someone who is in the position and is known by the gathering, the church, as an elder. Now, you have to understand something about uh, the early church. The early church is, was nothing like the churches today. The early church didn't have buildings like we have today. They didn't have Sunday school classrooms. They met in a home, 
And so a gathering of the church may have consisted of 15 or 20 people. And every one of those gatherings had someone in it that was known as the overseer, as the elder of that small, of that gathering of God's people. It would be sort of like our small groups that we have in this church right now. A small group that gathers at VZ's house, that gathers at my parents' house, that gathers at my house, that gathers here in the back rooms on Wednesdays and Tuesdays. Every one of those groups has somebody that leads that group, and they are people that have walked with God for a while, a significant time. They have a relationship with God, and they're leading those small groups. They are elders. Okay? Now, some of you have been walking with God for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, some 50 not many 60-year-old walks, but some of you have walked with God for 60 years. You've developed a relationship with the Lord. The church sees you as an elder in some way, shape, or form. So you need to remember what an elder is, okay? Number two, we get messed up with the word righteous. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What's he talking about? Well, he's not just talking about somebody who is saved. Now, granted, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are clothed with the righteousness of God. And God sees you as he sees his son. But when it's talking about the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, it's talking about someone who is not only saved, but they are walking with God, and when sin enters in their life, they, they immediately deal with that sin. They keep very short accounts of sin. They quickly and thoroughly deal with that sin. They have a bent toward walking right with God, living God's way. So when a person who is walking with God and living the way God wants them to live, they get involved in the type of prayer that we're going to be talking about. That prayer will be powerful and effective in the lives of other people. Now, let's look at the context before we tear this apart. James is writing to people who are suffering. They have been persecuted, driven from their homes. They've lost their land. They've lost their farms. They've lost their livelihood. They've lost many of their friends. They've been scattered abroad, driven out of Palestine, driven out of Jerusalem, They've settled in a new area, perhaps in the Mediterranean region or in Asia Minor. They have banded together with a small group of people who follow Jesus Christ. And they're banding together because of being persecuted. And they just need encouragement over having suffered these losses. James is writing to them and encourages them to remain faithful to Jesus Christ. Now, with that in context in mind, we're going to take a look at James chapter 5, verse 13 to 18, one phrase at a time. Verse 13 says this, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Now, most of the people James was writing to were in trouble. They were suffering. Persecution was severe. They had lost nearly everything. Some of them had suffered bodily injury. Some of them had physical wounds. Many were crushed in their mental and their emotional spirit. They were devastated. They were weary. They were weak. James says to them, don't think you can overcome your trouble, your suffering, by just being stoic. You've got to take it to the Lord. You need someone to come alongside of you and help you carry that burden. Take it to God. We have a song in our hymn book that we've all learned to sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. And verse 2 says, Are you weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Jesus, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. 
What James is trying to say to you and to me is when we suffer, when we enter into some trouble, when we enter into a conflict, don't try to carry that burden by yourself. Pray. Now the word pray here means continuously. Don't stop praying about the trouble or about the suffering that you're facing until God has stepped up to the plate and has lightened that load and you know that God has answered your prayer. Don't quit. I know people that have said to me, I took it to the Lord in prayer and he didn't do anything with it. And I'll say, well, how, how long did you pray about it? Well, I took it to him. I told him I was struggling with it, and I left it there with him. Now, I know God never forgets anything. But God tells us when we pray, we need to pray and keep praying and keep pleading with him until he has finished his work of lifting that load, easing that trouble, changing my reaction to what's going on. And I know God answers our prayers because I have gone through that time of pleading with God. Now, I know God hears me and I know God answers me, but I don't know how he does it. But somehow, he steps into my mind and into my heart and he encourages me. He changes my outlook. He answers my pleading in his time. The next phrase says this, Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Now, there were some people, evidently, who had gone through this uh, spiritual journey back in James' day. They saw people getting persecuted. They were persecuted, but some were along, and they were further along in their Christian walk, and persecution was something that they accepted, and, and they learned earlier in life to trust God, and so they weren't suffering. They didn't feel that this was a burden. They were, pray they were really happy in their own life. They were actually cheerful. And James says, well, if there's anybody that's cheerful, then you need to praise God, you need to sing to God, you need to rejoice that, you are, that you're cheerful. Uh, today, if your life is going good, if you don't have any trouble, if you're not suffering, if you don't need to be comforted, uh, you're not in need of spiritual healing, then you ought to praise God. Now, I want you to understand something. When you petition God, I have a need, that's prayer. When you sing songs of praise to God, that's prayer. Because in both situations, you're talking to God. In one case, you need something. In another case, you need to thank God. But in both cases, you're praying. So James is talking about prayer in this entire five verses. Next, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Okay, now James moves on and he says, he addresses those who are sick. Now, the word sick here is a very interesting word. It can mean physically sick, but it's not talking about being sick like you got a cold or you got strep throat or you got the flu. It is talking about if you are sick in this verse, you are really, really sick. You are like bedridden. You feel like you are going to die. This word is so deep, it's talking about people that are weak, but not just weak. They are really weak. They can't get out of bed. They're feeble. They, it's not that they're using a walker. They can't walk. They, they're impotent. They just can't keep going on. That's what it's talking about. Somebody who is that sick or that emotionally sick or that spiritually sick that they don't feel that they can go on anymore. 
An illustration of that is Paul. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12. Paul is talking in Romans chapter 12 about a thorn in his flesh. He doesn't tell us what it is, but whatever this thorn is, Paul has gone to God in three different seasons of his life and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that God would remove that thorn in the flesh. So what I'm getting from this passage is that Paul is saying, Lord, I don't know if I can go on any longer serving you, being your soldier, being your warrior. This thorn in my flesh has gotten me down so bad. I need you to take the thorn away or I'm not going to be able to go on any longer. God says to him, I know you're devastated. I know you're defeated. But my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. You say, why do you tell me that? Because the word for weakness is the same word that James uses for sick. Same identical word. So what James is trying to say and what Paul is trying to say, there is a time in our life where there are some things that come into our life that literally zap us of all of our energy, all of our joy, all of our excitement. We don't think we can go one step farther. So what do you do? You call the elders. Those people that James is writing to, some of them have been beaten physically. Some of them probably had infected wounds. Some of them were so weak, they were unable to even pray for themselves. Devastated, emotionally sick, spiritually sick, physically sick. It could be all of those things. And whatever their sickness, it was beyond their ability to handle it themselves. They were defeated. They were unable to draw upon the power of God to handle their trouble on their own. I remember when I was in seminary, I went to a church, Salem Baptist Church. Pastor of that church was Lyndon Caro, and Lyndon Caro got lymphosarcoma, and he died in about nine months. He was laying in the hospital bed, and he looked up at the men that surrounded him, and he said to them, I am so exhausted, I can't even pray. And Emmett Johnson leaned over and looked him in the eye and said, Lyndon, you don't need to pray anymore. We'll pray for you. We'll do your praying for you. That's what an elder does. An elder comes alongside of people that no longer can pray and they say, I will do your praying for you. And then they come and they anoint you with oil. You know, olive oil back then had medical value. When somebody had infections, they poured oil on that. Somebody would, had wounds that were hard and brittle, they pour oil on it, make it more subtle or supple, I guess that's the word. It soothed them. Open wounds would heal better with oil on it. If a person had been persecuted and beaten, he probably needed some oil poured on those wounds. And what's really interesting, it says in the anointing with oil, literally means they oiled them. I picture a massage, you're on the table, and they're massaging the oil in, Okay. It could have been James' way of saying to us in the 21st century, you're going to call the elders and you also ought to get the best medical attention you possibly should get. I know that when people come and they're devastated and they're emotionally drained, and they talk to me in my office, I will say to them, when was the last time you've had a physical? And they look at me and I go, why? Why? Just want to make sure that what you're battling with isn't something physical. Okay? 
It may not be a spiritual problem. It may be a physical problem. Let's get the best medical attention you can possibly get. But oil is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of his presence. So when the elders come, they listen to the person, the best that the person can speak, and then they anoint them with oil, and they do the anointing in the name of the Lord, which means they're saying they are doing what they believe Jesus would do for this person, and they pray. And again, this word pray doesn't mean they just pray once and they get up and leave and go home. They pray and they pray and they pray and they pray, and it says they pray in faith, Faith in what? Faith in God. Faith in the God who said, if you pray in faith, that you'll raise him up. So they're praying in faith that there is a God who will answer and honor his word. And when they pray in faith, the Bible says, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The word for well is the Greek word so-so, S-O-S-O. The word translates differently in other passages of Scripture. It has different meanings, such as it will save, it means to deliver, it means to rescue, it means to restore, it means to make whole, it means to make well. So when we go to prayer for, when elders go to prayer for someone who has called them and they annoy with oil and they pray in faith, it says that God will so so. He will respond to that prayer and make the person whole. He will remove the weariness. He will restore their joy. He will rescue them from the feeling of devastation. And at times, he will heal them completely. But God is going to be at work in that person's life. I remember... I took uh, three elders with me to the University of Pennsylvania. We had a family, an individual from our church who was battling cancer. And they wanted us to come and anoint with oil and to pray for their healing. And we began to pray, and one of the elders just got up and he left the room and he just disappeared. So the two of us were there in the room and we prayed for that person. Um, after we got done praying, the other elder got up and left, and the husband of the wife got up and left. And I was left in the room, and I looked at the woman who we had just prayed for, and I said to her, is there anything else that we can do for you at this time? And she looked up at me, and she said, yeah, I'd like to have a relationship with God like your wife has. I said, really? Okay. We began to talk about it. And she said, I've been religious all my life, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've served God. I've played the organ, led choirs, but I don't have a relationship with God. So that night, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. And she was gloriously saved. All of a sudden, she was filled with joy and excitement of seeing Jesus face to face. They moved her from the University of Pennsylvania. They moved her back down here to Jennersville so she could be close to her family when she died. And she was a testimony to everybody that walked in the door. As soon as they walked into her room, she said, I got to tell you, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior on such and such a night. And I know that when I die, I'm going to see Jesus People would come into the room. She said, I'm going to go see Jesus before you see Jesus. She was excited about seeing Jesus. And guess what? She died. But she died with a smile on her face. Did God heal her? You say, well, no, he didn't. Well, he delivered her. Boy, did he deliver her. Delivered her from hell. Rescued her, restored her, made her whole. No, she didn't get well physically until she died and went home to be with Jesus. But God answered our prayer differently than we were hoping he would. We were hoping he would make her better. He did. 
but he just didn't take the cancer away. Now we go from the top, okay? Listen carefully. Go from the top. James says this. If a person is suffering, in trouble, in conflict, that person needs to pray. And keep praying until God lifts that load. Second, if you're happy, joyful, you need to sing songs of praise to God. Third, if a person is so beaten down, so physically or emotionally or spiritually unable to pray for themselves, wounded in soul, wounded in spirit, physically sick, where they know it's impossible for them to rise up above that situation, where they don't think they can be a soldier for God anymore because they're so down. They've lost all their enthusiasm, they're all excite, all their excitement for God. Then they are to call the elders, have the elders anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, pray for them in faith, and God promises he'll save them, deliver them, rescue them, restore them, make the person whole. Whatever God feels that person must have then, God will give it to them. Remember when Jesus would reach out and heal somebody? Sometimes he would say, your faith has saved you. Sometimes he would say, your faith has made you whole. What Jesus was saying is the same words that James uses when James says he'll make you well. He's going to make you whole. He's going to do what God knows to do and what he knows is best for that situation. Next phrase is, and the Lord will raise them up. And the word for raised up means to rebuild, to awaken, to excite. So the person who couldn't even pray for themselves will be touched by God so powerfully that they'll find new excitement, new enthusiasm. They'll be made alive. They'll be made spiritually whole and emotionally whole, just like God did for that person at the University of Pennsylvania in one night. And then it says, if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Why does James say that in this prayer? It seems like out of place, you know. What I believe James is saying is this, when we get down, and we get down and out because of our circumstances, when we are in pain, when we are suffering spiritually and emotionally and and wrestling with things, sometimes we say things we shouldn't say to somebody else. Someone that's reaching out and trying to help us, we push them away with our words. We say hurtful things to them. And sometimes we get angry with God. And we say things to God that we should not say. And I have said that you need to be honest with God. But don't sin with your lips. Don't curse God. Don't blame God. But you can be honest with God. But God says to us, if you are the person that the elders are coming to, to pray for and minister to you in prayer, that as they minister to you in prayer, God will reach down and cleanse that sin from your life. Isn't that neat? He just says, I understand where that came from, and I'm going to cleanse that. Next it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now the word therefore means that uh, there's a transition here in the text. James has been saying that those who suffer, uh, they need to pray for themselves. Those who are happy, they need to praise God themselves. Those who are sick, they need to, uh, so sick they can't pray for themselves. They're to call the elders and they'll pray for them. Then he turns to the small group gatherings, the small group sessions, like our Sunday night small groups like our Wednesday morning small groups, like our Tuesday afternoon small groups, our Wednesday morning small group. And he says to the small groups, which are really the church gathering, aren't they? Are you the church? Okay, and when you get together, are you the church? 
Okay, so he's talking to the church, but he's talking about the church in the small gatherings, and he says to them, when you get together and you go to pray for each other, you ought to confess your sins. <laughs> That's scary. You're just sitting there with six or seven guys and say, did you know what I did last night? I shouldn't have done I should, you know. That's not what he's talking about, okay? He's talking about you're going to go to prayer and you've got something that you're really struggling with and you know it's sin. And the word confess here is a word that means let it out, to be honest, to share your struggle, let the people know your battle. And so you go to the person and say, listen, before we pray, I need you to pray for me. I'm really struggling with worry. Or I'm really struggling with my tongue. I, I gossip so much. And you just let them know that you're struggling. Or maybe you have an addiction. Nobody knows about it around that little group of people. You say, I, I really need your help. I'm struggling with an addiction. Now, what have you just done? You've confessed your sin. God has heard it. The few that are around you have heard it. And what are they going to do for you now? They're going to pray. They're going to pray. Now, we're not talking about just airing your dirty laundry out before 150 people. We're talking about finding some people that are just like you who have gathered together to be in the Word and to pray and to share with them what you are struggling with and that doesn't mean every time you get together, five people are going to say, I got five sins and I got this sin, I got that sin. It's talking about that you come together and you realize that, man, I got to deal with this and I need help. And you share it with them. And they pray for you. What does it say will happen? Help me out. So that you may be healed. And there's that word again, rescued, restored. I want you to think of this. We just had a picture of the whole church, didn't we? The whole community of Christ followers knows how to pray for themselves. So we do. We have spiritual leaders who are willing to minister prayer of restoration for those who are unable to pray for themselves. And then we have Christians who are gathering together in small groups who share their struggles and addictions with each other so that they can experience God's deliverance and God's restoration that's necessary in their lives. And what happens is, is then you have an entire church that is whole. Individually, those that are really sick, those of us who are going through life as if nothing's wrong, and we're hiding some of these things and we need help with, God says you can be healed, you can be whole. And I love this next phrase, is the prayer of the righteous person is so powerful and effective. Ah. Now remember this, Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Which means it doesn't mean he doesn't, he doesn't recognize you asked him, but he doesn't hear you with the intent to answer. Okay? So if you've come to pray for somebody, but you've got sin in your life that you're not dealing with, God is not going to answer your prayers. So that means that you are not a righteous person at that time, Although you're right with God, you're not living right, and because you're not living right, God isn't going to hear your prayers, and so there you are praying for somebody else, and God is going. Get right with me. Get right with me. The prayer of righteous person is powerful and effective. I don't have to say any more about that, do I? Just get right with God before you start praying for people. And then it says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are, he prayed earnestly, it wouldn't rain, 
and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. And again, he prayed, and the earth gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Elijah had passions like we have. He, he suffered like we do. He got hungry like we do. He got afraid like we do. He got tired in battle like we do. He was just a man. But he was right with God, and he lived a righteous life. And he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain on Israel, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And God used that drought to discipline Israel and get them ready to come back. And then Elijah prayed that the rain would come, and the rain did come, and it refreshed the land and refreshed the people. When I read through that, I said, wow, what God is saying to all of us is this. We can have a prayer life like Elijah. If we... We can open up the storehouse of God's blessing in the lives of people. We can pray for people who are so sick and so discouraged and so defeated and so down and so spiritually wearied that they can't go on. And our prayers can bring about healing and restoration and revival and rescue and deliverance and make person whole and bring forgiveness of sins. You ever think of your prayers like that? That's what God wants for this church. That's what he wants for every small group gathering of God's people. To have that type of prayer. Prayer for ourselves, prayer for those that are down and out, and prayer that will set us free from our sin so that we might be righteous people so that our prayers are powerful and effective. What a blessing, what a ministry prayer can be. Let's uh, stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, I don't think we've even scratched the surface of how much prayer, how it works. Sometimes we get physical problems or emotional problems ourselves, and we come to you and two or three times we ask you to help and, and then it doesn't seem like you're helping and we stop praying. And we miss out on that relationship where we pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and then all of a sudden we realize, I don't need to pray about that anymore. I'm happy, I'm joyful, I'm restored. The burden's been lifted. Some of us forget about praising you when things are going good and, and we miss out on that relationship again of praying and thanking you for how you've blessed our life. And then there are those in the body of Christ who are so beaten down for whatever reason they can't even pray for themselves. And they forget about calling a group of people who are walking with you to come alongside of them and to pray for them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and to pray in faith. And, and we miss out on watching you bring about restoration and wholeness into their lives. And, and then, Lord, we miss out at times on being in small group gatherings with other people who have a relationship with you through faith in Christ and we get busy maybe praying and, and we don't see any answers to our prayers and, and then we realize it could be because we have sin in our life. We have something that we're just not getting victory over and we need to ask those in that small group gathering to, to pray for us for victory. And we miss out on seeing you set people free because we don't take the time to let it out and be honest with each other. Lord, help us take, to take this message this morning and put it into practice in our life. Because, Lord, we want to be whole. Individually and as a church. So thank you, Lord, for how you're going to work. And help us to remember the words of Paul, that you are a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. 
so that you receive glory through the church and through your son, Jesus Christ. And this we pray in his name. Amen.